afternoon. Today we're going to cover the last module in our textbook out of the Welding Inspection Technology. I'm on page 10-2. This is uh, Visual Inspection and Other NDE Methods and Symbols. Uh, this will be the last one that we cover out of this uh, and it's going to deal with uh, die penetrate, mag particle testing, ultrasonic testing, eddy current, x-ray, visual inspection, and it's going to touch on a lot, uh, a little bit of a, 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 on all of those things. Um, the first one, of course, is going to be visual inspection. What we've done in the past, uh, we, we've examined some weld replicas, we've taken some measurements, we've covered module 9 and identified some defects. This goes a little more in depth and talks about the overall responsibilities of the welding inspector in terms of what you're going to do before, during, and after the welding. So let me draw your attention to, the, uh, to our first slide here. And it says visual inspection and other NDE methods and symbols. What, is vis what about visual inspection? Well, it's very cost effective. It's limited to the surface only. That's something you should note. Visual inspection is limited to the surface only. It requires training, experience, welding knowledge, the use of proper inspection tools, and it must be a continuous and ongoing process. Um, it's got to be done before you start. There's a lot of things to accomplish, and if you look at that blue, bo uh, blue box on page 10.3, it will list some of those things. Uh, before, during, and after, there's a topic on each one of those. And our text will talk about all of these individual items. Uh, we'll review documents, check the welding procedures, qualify and certify the welders, establish hold points. Now, if you look at this list, this is all stuff that we have talked about in the past. But now it's kind of all uh, summarized for us in, in our text. So if you look on page 10.3 under visual inspection, highlight that and put a bullet by it where it says, um, since the welding inspector's responsibilities can be extensive and will occur at various stages of the fabrication sequence, it is uh, a helpful aid is an inspection checklist. Now that blue box is an inspection checklist, uh, which would come in handy for you. If you go to the next column where it says, uh, in some respects, the responsibilities of the welding inspector prior to the start of welding may be the most important. Uh, it can at least be said that unless flip the page, unless this aspect of the inspection job is performed satisfactorily, they, there may be problems encountered later in the fabrication process. Um, I've highlighted that entire column on page 10-4 because these are all things that you have to do before the welding begins. Uh, the second paragraph reads, one of the first duties of the welding inspector at the onset of a job is to review all of the documentation pertaining to that job. So you've got to look over all the documentation and this could include uh, a work scope. Uh, a work scope is a document that details usually step by step um, what the welding is going to entail, uh, if something's going to be repaired, it will identify what what is going to be repaired, the process is used. And so you want to look at all of that and if there's a if there's a contract you would want to review the contract. So read that and uh, become familiar with that. And then down at the bottom of that column it says another preliminary step related to the materials being used is to check whether or not there are welding procedures which cover the required welding. In addition to the types of materials being welded, the welding inspector must check if the qualified welding procedures provide adequate coverage with regard to welding processes, techniques, filler metal type, position, and so forth. So you want to review all of that before things get, get started. Um, so here we go. What are some of the things you're going to do before welding? You're going to check the base metal and the filler metal. And we've talked about MTRs, mill test reports. Uh, you're going to check those to make sure they match up with, with the material that, that's going to be used. Uh, and, and remember, it's, they have to have identifying numbers on the base metals. And if, the, if those heat numbers don't match up, then you can't use it if you're trying to do a code job. You're going to check the filler metals to make sure the filler metals are properly tagged and identified and that if, they, if there are electrode storage considerations, you have to take those into consideration. Are there procedures in place that will address those needs? Do you have a rod of them available in case they have to be stored in a rod of them? Do you have a checkout list and a return list 
so that your qualified welders will check out only a certain amount of welding electrode rod at, at a time and then they'll return any of it that, that's not used. All of these things have to be considered. Then you want to check the welding equipment. Is it the right type of welding equipment? Is it in good working order? Uh, you may even have to take a, uh, a gauge and, and, uh, and, and throw it on there and, and make sure that the, the welding equipment is reading correctly so that if a welder's got his machine set at 120 amps, it really is running at 120 amps. Then you want to check the weld preparations, the joint fit up, the weld joint cleanliness, check any preheat uh, that may be required, and all of these things are detailed on, uh, on page 10.4 and 10.5. So if you look on page 10.4 in the second column, go down to uh, the third paragraph and put a bullet there. It says, it is often helpful for the welding inspector if there is a listing of all the production welders showing those procedures which they are considered qualified to perform. Further, some codes require that the welders permanently identify all of the production welds that have been made. If this is the case, there should be an accompanying log showing the appropriate identification stamp of each welder. On, on most code jobs, your welders will be identified, usually they identify them by their initials, um, but sometimes they'll issue them letters. For example, in, in my working career, I've been AA or 00 or, or LP. Uh, sometimes they'll do it with a number or, or a combination of a number and a letter and there'll be a log and this log will list all the welders, the welder's name, what they're qualified in, and their identification number. And as, as a welder or a team of welders complete a weld, they have to go ahead and identify that weld. And a lot of times, if you have a weld and you've got a team of welders, you may have you may be the team of welders that just go in and put in the root pass. You may be responsible for fitting it up and just putting in the root pass. And then if, if that's the case, you would put your initials right next to the joint and then another team may come along behind you and fill it and cap it and they would then put their initials on the outside of yours. So that the, the way you would read this is whoever was closest to the joint is the person or the team that put in the root. Whoever was on the outside of that is the person or team that filled and capped it. So it's just a way that you would come up and, and be able to track who did what. Now it's been my experience that uh, as the welding inspector, this is an area that you really have to monitor because a foreman, superintendents, production people, when they're turned loose on a job, they just want to get it done and they're not averse to taking a person who's not qualified to weld on a boiler tube, for example, and throwing them on that boiler tube just to get the work done. So uh, a good thing is, is if you don't let anybody work on the boiler that isn't qualified to do it all. Unfortunately, uh, in the real world, you'll find that it's difficult to get enough qualified people to man most jobs. And so you might have a plate welder uh, and your list says, well, uh, Billy Bob Thornton here is only qualified to weld on plate, but gosh, you know, this other welder, he, he didn't come in tonight. We've got to get somebody over here to work with this boiler tube welder, and, and if you're not aware of it, they may take Billy Bob and put him over there with this other guy, even though he's not qualified. And, of course, that's a violation of the code. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of production people overlook that because they want to get the job done. So it falls on you to have that list, and you can go chew butt and all that, but be aware that, that companies will, will cut corners in order to get the job done. So that's one of the most critical things you've got to watch as to make sure that nobody is welding on something they're not qualified to weld on. Uh, staying on page 10, four, second column, do, drop to the last paragraph and says, once the welding inspector has reviewed the appropriate documents related to the specific inspection job, he or she may elect to establish hold points. Uh, these are simply uh, Pre-selected steps in the fabrication sequence when the work must stop until the inspector has a chance to review the work completed to that point. Uh, we've talked about hold points before. They're very important in some cases. Uh, a lot of times, they're, they're essential if you have internal components that you would not be able to get to to inspect later on. For example, if we had a, uh, I think I used this example once before, if we had a pressure vessel and we put a head on one end, and there's an opening in here, and, and later on we'll put a pipe in there, or maybe, a, maybe there'll be a pipe coming in here, uh, and it might have a deflector plate so that whatever's coming in splashes off this way, and you put a baffle in here. 
Well, if you've got a baffle in there, uh, you've got to be able to get to this side to inspect it. And if you've hung this head on, there's no way to get to the inside now to inspect that to make sure it was properly welded. So you would have a hold point so that you, uh, this, this head would not go on until the inspector bought off on that, on that uh, baffle being welded out properly. So they're essential in some, some cases, and they are convenient in others. Uh, for example, let's go back to this boiler tube that we talked about. In a, in a perfect world, what you want to do is go in and inspect this fit up, make sure that the gap is, is correct, uh, and there's any, the proper preheat is done and everything, before they ever put the root pass in. So you would want to inspect the, the, the joint fit up, and then the root, and then the final. So there's, there's three different times that you would want to look at this thing. So uh, telling them to fit it up and stop then would be a hold point. You want them to stop until you can check that fit to make sure it's within code. But uh, again, that's a perfect world. A lot of times you can't do that. You, can't, you can ask them, but then you'll, you might get accused of, of holding up production, costing the contractor money, and it just goes on and on and on and gets into arguments. So uh, again, in an ideal world, you would want to have a hold point so you could check, check that fit up. Uh, it's a good job if you can get, get by and check most of them or check some of them. And as you're working with, with welders and you get to know the welders on a particular job, you, you kind of get a feel for who you can trust and who you can't. And uh, of course, you're going to be a little more, uh, uh, you're going to have a little more scrutiny on those people that you feel are trying to cut corners and stuff. So uh, joint fit up would be another whole point that we would want to establish. Um, go over to page 10.5. First column, second paragraph says, another important preliminary step for the welding inspector is to develop a suitable plan for performing the inspections and recording and maintaining the results. Through experience, the welding inspector becomes more aware of how important this step can be. The inspector must know when a particular inspection task is to be performed and how it will be accomplished. There must be a plan so that important aspects of fabrication process are not left uninspected. Now, as I said, we'd, we'd like to check the joint fit up, we'd like to check the root, we'd like to check the final on this. So what we have is we have a chart, and they call it a weld map. And this weld map, I may have talked about this before, this weld map is just an Excel document or something like that, and across here it will identify uh, uh, something like a superheater. And then you're going to identify uh, your, your various rows of tubes. And then you may have a checkoff for uh, fit up, uh, root, uh, cap. And you would, you would check it off as, the, as these things were done. And this would be your, your map. And then finally, out here on the end, you would have uh, VT for visual and accepted and then maybe RT, because you would randomly x-ray a few of those. So you would, you would keep track of all this stuff on a weld map to identify all the different welds. And sometimes, sometimes there could be thousands, thousands and thousands of them. Some jobs are small, some jobs are big. And just, you still have to keep, keep track of them and document them. Um, Second paragraph in that column says, once an inspection has been performed, there must be a suitable system established for the recording of the inspection results. This system should include provisions for the type, types and contents of reports, the distribution of those reports, as well as some method of logically maintaining the records so that they can be retrieved and reviewed by others familiar with the job. It says basically the reports and the system developed to maintain those reports should be as simple as possible while still providing adequate information which is understandable to all personnel involved at some future review. Um, I believe that most x-rays, for example, an x-ray radiograph is, is a permanent record. Uh, and I believe that most codes say that they have to be retrievable and reviewable three years down the road after the job has been done. And the same with your inspection results. Uh, it, it, these weld maps that I talked about should be available for review later on in case something comes up. Put a bullet by the next uh, paragraph and says, another related matter involves the identification and treatment of rejects. At the beginning of every job, the welding inspector must establish some system whereby a rejected weld can be reported and identified. And we would do that on our weld map. We have a little square on there. Um, you don't buy off on it until it's accepted. 
And if, if you're accepting it and there's something wrong with it, you would mark the rejected box and you would also identify why you didn't accept it. And then the people doing the work would, would receive a report of that. They would, as, they would assign people to fix that and then you would go back and, to you, and, and re-inspect it until you finally bought it off. Um, down at the bottom of that column it says, the marking used to indicate the presence and location of a defect should be some unique type of color or color so that it is visibly clearly visible and descriptive to both quality control and person, uh, production personnel. One of the first things I do in, in, in boiler inspection, and, and a lot of people do this, is uh, you'll, you'll go into the boiler, and I think, I, again, I talked about this before, a, bo a boiler is nothing but a big box, and, and the walls are lined with, with boiler tubes all the way around, and you'll go inside and you'll inspect inside and outside on, 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 that, on the boiler wall and you'll look for things that are wrong. Uh, you might have cracks, you might have wear, you might have uh, holes in the tubes. And then you would use spray paint to identify and color code whatever it is you found. You may, you may have an area that might be six feet by 10 feet. Uh, and you, would, you would, might spray paint that with red, meaning that you're going to cut it out and replace that entire area with new tubes. Or you make them over here and, and this one just, okay, we're going to put in a, we're going to put in a, 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 a heat sink here, a, or a, a, a heat monitoring device. So we, want to, we, we just want to cut out one tube and replace it with a, with a thermostat, essentially. And so you, would, you might mark that white so that we would know that there's only going to be one tube mar uh, cut out there. And you would uh, put its location and its elevation, they call it the elevation. And, uh, and on your weld map, it would have the elevation to help identify that. And also that would say, well, is it on the front wall or is it on the side wall or whatever? So you would have to identify where it's at, use the spray paint color coding system to mark it up so that it's clear to everybody uh, exactly what's going on. Because if you make a mistake on something like this, it could delay the project and it could cost thousands of dollars for, for a simple mistake. And as an inspector, very well-respected guy, uh, told me once, he says, there's only two types of welding inspectors, those that have made mistakes and those that are going to make mistakes. So you want to try to eliminate the mistakes as much as possible. Uh, go over on to the next column now. Mm, middle paragraph, put a bullet, highlight it, it says, once all of these tasks have been performed, it is now time to perform some pre-weld inspection of the materials and their configurations. One of these steps is to evaluate the quality of the base materials and the welding filler metals. Now I talked about that a little bit already. You're going to match them up against your MTRs and make sure they're the right stuff um, and uh, that the right material is going in where it's supposed to go in. Drop down to the last paragraph in that column and highlight it, put a bullet by it. It says the inspection of the base material will vary from simple visual inspection of the metal surface to an elaborate combination of various non-destructive test methods to evaluate both the surface and subsurface quality of the material. The criticality of the structure or component will dictate to a certain degree the extent of inspection required. Remember we talked about criticality before and that goes back to service conditions. Uh, the inside of a boiler where, you're, where you've got temperatures in the thousands of degrees and pressure and steam running up and down through these uh, boiler tubes, that's a lot more critical service conditions than it would be if we were to go out here into this field and, and bury a pipe and run 100 pounds of, of gas pressure through it. So you have to take your, your service conditions into consideration. Uh, flip the page to 10-6, uh, top of the first column, it says, inspection of the welding filler material to be used is also very important. Moisture or contamination present in the flux or on the electrode surface can result in serious weld quality problems. For example, if low hydrogen electrodes are required, problems such as underbead cracking and porosity can result if they are not properly protected from the atmosphere. Therefore, the welding inspector should be aware of how they will be stored and handled to prevent the pickup of excessive moisture or contamination. So that has to be addressed prior to the start of the job. Uh, bullet in the next paragraph, it says, after the inspection of all the materials to be used, the next step is to evaluate the quality and accuracy of the weld joint preparations. I talked a little bit of that, about that already. Typically, it, it will be defined on your welding procedure plus or minus uh, a certain amount, certain tolerances. Sometimes it'll be plus a sixteenth, but minus none. You can't get any, any, any narrower, but you can get a little wider. So it just, just depends. That would be your job to inspect that and make sure that it's as accurate as, as, as is required. 
Uh, next paragraph, it's a bullet highlight. It says, after the well joint preparations have been checked and approved, the welding inspector should then evaluate the well joint fit up. And in some cases now, it, uh, figure 10-4 in your book, lower right hand corner, talks about pre-bending and pre-setting. Um, you can do that somewhat with, with plate, but not so much with pipe. Uh, this is the this is the slide, this is the figure that's in there, and you can see here what they've done. Here in this example of a T-joint, they've deliberately bent it a little bit, and then when they added the weld, the shrinkage forces of the weld pulled it straight. Here they have a single V-groove, and they've, they've preset it uh, by, by bending it away from the direction of, of, of the weld, and then when the weld goes in, it pulls it straight, and again here on this piece of plate example that they've got. Um, here they've drawn, drawn us out one, another one where they put a wedge in here and uh, clamps along the edges to, to pre-bend this thing so that, again, it will, it will not distort uh, as much as it otherwise would. And, and one caveat now, uh, stainless will, will draw a lot more than carbon. Stainless draws about 30% more than carbon, so you want to keep that in mind. In a boiler situation like I've been talking about, uh, one, of the, one of the big problems that, uh, that you'll run into is often the boiler tubes, when they go to make this fit up, they, sometimes the people aren't as experienced as you would like and they'll end up with too big a gap, which is why I like to, why I like to check it. And sometimes that gap might be a half of an inch. Well, that's a pretty wide gap. And, if you talk to most welders out there, they'll say, oh, I can get that, I can make that work. Well, sure, you probably could make that work, but is it within the, the, the scope of the welding procedure? Probably not. It's not very often you're gonna see a, a, a welding procedure that would allow a one half inch gap. So you wanna catch that. But, so there's really not any way to, to preset this or save it, but one of the tricks they like to use is to take a rosebud, uh, which is a, an attachment that goes on the end of an oxyacetylene torch, and they'll wash it up and down on, this, on these tubes. And what happens when we dump heat into, into the steel? It excites the atoms, the atoms grow, and this gap gets a little more narrow. And so that's one way they, have, they like to cheat. And then once they get it up there, they'll go ahead and weld it, and you never know the difference. You know, so they'll, they'll wipe it off or something, so you can't tell that it was ever heated. But, of course, now what's happened? Well, th there's, there's extra stress loaded up in here. So you want to make sure that that, that doesn't happen. This, this type of sweating the tubes is, is, is not allowed because of the residual stresses that are left in there. Uh, what, what, the way it should be fixed would be to go ahead and, and cut it out, and then you would end up with this down here, and this is gone. So now you've got this big old gap, so you've got to put in what's called, what is called a Dutchman or a, a, another spool piece right in here, and you'd end up having two welds. Well, it's extra work, yes, but now it's been done correctly. So you want to make sure that things are done correctly. And this is a very common occurrence that you'll see this a lot, especially if you have people that don't really know what they're doing. Now, some crews and some companies are a lot better than others, but the, I, I have had to do inspections on some companies that, that boy, they did a lot of this and it cost them money. Um, okay, now in the second column on page 10-6, second paragraph, put a bullet and says, the accuracy of the joint fit-up will have an effect on the final dimensions of the weldment. In addition, variations in the fit-up could have a direct bearing on the resulting weld quality. For example, if the groove angle or groove opening is insufficient, the welder may not be able to properly fuse the weld metal to the groove face. Excessive groove angles or root openings may require additional welding, which in turn could result in excessive distortion, um, and so forth. Go over to the Ten, page 10.7 now, drop down to the second paragraph and highlight that. It says, if any jigs, fixtures, or other alignment devices are used, the welding inspector should check to assure that they provide proper alignment and that they are massive enough to maintain the alignment during the welding operation. If tack welds are added to assist in this alignment, they should be inspected to assure that they are not defective. Cracked tack welds should be removed and redeposited prior to the final welding. Remember that tacks become part of the weldment and if we have a situation where, this, like this tube I was just describing, they tack it up, go to lunch, 
and it's drawn back and now that one of those tacks is cracked and then they come back in and they try to put the weld in it. What happens if you weld over a crack? It simply propagates, yes, so they have to remove the tack completely. Um, and of course if you're going to use jigs and fixtures to, to align something, always remember that, that you're going to leave residual stresses in there. And, and I, I've worked in situations where you've had to take a piece of six inch pipe and maybe pull it over this way four inches to get up to line up with another one and and then that other one has to be pulled down and so you you pull these pipe and well there's stress in the pipe somewhere at the other end where that joint was fit up or, or there's going to be stress right here where this joint was fit up so you got to take into consideration that residual stress how are you going to relieve that stress are you simply going to leave it in there or are you going to post well heat treat it in some way so if you have to use uh, jigs and fixtures and stuff you're going to leave some stresses in there and you have to think about the criticality of those stresses. Are they going to affect the final weldment or not? Go over to the next uh, next column. Now I've highlighted it from where it says one final feature to the, to the remainder of that. It says one final feature should be checked prior to the commencement of welding and that's preheat. Uh, the welding procedure will indicate the requirements for this preheat and it may be stated as either a minimum, a maximum, or both. And this specified preheat should be checked slightly away from the weld joint instead of on the groove face. Now this is a, your important part. In fact, all base metal within a distance equal to the thickness of the members, but not less than three inches, uh, should be raised to the appropriate preheat temperature. So if you have to, if you have to preheat a joint before you start welding it, you want, you're, as the inspector, you're going to take one of these crayons like you see in, in figure 10-6, and you're going to go out there with the appropriate numbered crayon and you're going to mark that pipe three inches away from the joint and see if your stick melts and that's where you're going to check it. Don't go over there and put it on the groove face and run it right down the groove face because that's that's not a large enough preheated area so the heat sink isn't enough. Um, temperature measurements why do we want to do it? Well you, you're, going to, you're going to take temperature measurements to check for preheat Sometimes you have to check the inner pass temperature. Remember, sometimes we can't go over a certain inner pass temperature. Uh, some welders will get carried away and they'll go pass after pass after pass after pass and raise that temperature up above 550. Typically, if you get up above 550 on a lot of material, then that's going to be too high. So you want to check your welding procedure to see what the maximum inner pass temperature is. And then there may be some post-weld heat treatments that, that are required. So you, you would chart that out uh, on, on a graph whenever the post-weld heat treatment was taking place and it would be graft and typically uh, post weld heat treatment if it's just stress relieving they're going to take it up to about 1150 degrees and uh, hold it for a prescribed time and then and then bring it back down again uh, so how do you check them it says that by using sens uh, temperature sensitive crayons and digital pyrometers and this is the same picture that's in your book now here you might be able to see it a little bit better it starts at 125 and goes all the way up to 350 and these are 25 degree increments so uh, they, they don't jump up very high, but I've got some in the tool room that, that go over 1,000. They'll go up to 1,100. So uh, you can get them in just about any temperature that you want to. Um, let's see. Okay, let's stay on page 107 now. I'll come back to this slide in a minute. It says, in order to continue the ongoing welding quality control, the welding inspector also has numerous things to check as the welding is actually being performed. As was the case for those inspections performed prior to welding, these checks can hopefully detect problems when they occur so they can be more easily corrected. During this phase of the fabrication process, the inspector's knowledge of welding will be extremely beneficial since part of the inspection will involve the evaluation of the actual welding technique as well as the resulting weld quality. It is realized that it is unrealistic to think that the welding inspector can observe the deposition of each and every weld pass. Therefore, the experienced welding inspector should be able to select those aspects of the welding sequence which are considered to be critical enough to warrant his or her presence. Uh, this next line, the next paragraph is a bullet, and I've actually underlined this. It says, when conducting welding inspection during the welding operation, the welding inspector must rely on the welding procedure to provide a basis for inspection. This document will specify all of those important aspects of the welding operation, including welding process, materials, specific technique, preheat, interpass temperatures, plus any additional information which describe how the uh, production welding should be performed. So always, if you get an argument, 
whip out that, that welding procedure and say, here it is. You violated the welding procedure. Here's why you violated the welding procedure. And if you're talking to a hand, you can't really talk to a hand like that. So you would go and talk to his foreman and say, okay, foreman, how are you guys gonna, gonna remedy this situation? So that's an important part. And uh, then bullet by the next paragraph where it says, so the welding inspector's job, and this is, this is critical, will essentially consist of monitoring the production welding to assure that it is being conducted in accordance with the appropriate procedure. I like to use the analogy of, of being a referee on the football field. You, you, you don't get involved in the game until you see something going wrong and then you pull the flag out and say, whoop, hold up, time out. Here, let's, what are we gonna do here? So that's what you're doing. It's usually the contractor's job to provide their own weld quality control. Their own people would watch over their own people to make sure everything's being done in accordance, but uh, a third party on a set of eyes that's out there just to make sure that, uh, as, as that old Chinese saying used to go, uh, locks were meant to keep honest men honest. You're there to be th to make sure that, that the people are following the code. Um, so you're there to make sure that, that these honorable people are doing things in an honorable way. Um, okay, let's go here to our slide. So what, what are we doing? Well, we're going to look, we're going to watch how the welder is doing, doing the job. Uh, so we're going to note welder skills. And then we're going to check the welding variables and make sure that they are, are complying with the welding procedure. Uh, whenever possible, examine the tacks and the roots. Now, we talked about the possibility of the tacks being cracked. Um, and one of the things we're looking for there, both on the tacks and on the roots, are fish eyes. A lot of times a fish eye, as we've talked about in the past, is, is, is where a person will pull out of the, the weld root a little too fast and puddle tension will draw some of that excess weld metal with it and it thins the weld metal in that spot and it makes a little, a little hole almost. Sometimes that hole will go all the way through the root and sometimes it won't. So you want to inspect for, for fish eyes on that and if you have one then it's got to be ground out and the metal redeposited. If there's any back gouging being done, you have to check the back gouge surfaces to make sure that the appropriate uh, cleaning took place. Once it's back gouged, did, did they do some grinding? Did they do some buffing? Did they clean it up? Did they take it back down to clean white steel? Did they get, a, get rid of all that oxidation from the back gouging operation so that there's not going to be any problems with the weld? Uh, check any preheat temperatures if necessary. Check interpass temperatures if, nef if necessary. And then interpass cleaning. As I've said many times in the past, welders are lazy and some of them uh, late for lunch, they want to get that last pass in there and don't worry about that, we'll just burn through the slag. So you got to kind of keep an eye on that as well. Uh, this is a digital pyrometer. Um, this will give you the temperature just like the, the, the crayons will, only this is a little more accurate. You can see right here it's showing 97 degrees. Okay, on page 10.8 now, go ahead and highlight uh, the third paragraph where it says one of the parts of the welding inspection which occur during welding is the visual examination of the individual weld passes as they are deposited. Essentially everything that we've talked about is, is going to be detailed in your text. And then in the next to last paragraph highlight that and put a bullet that says checking the end process quality is especially critical in the case of the root pass or the root layer. So you want to check all of those that you can. Over in the next column uh, highlight that first paragraph, put a bullet, says another feature which should be evaluated during the welding operation relates to the interpass cleaning. If the welder fails to thoroughly clean the weld deposit between individual passes, there is a great possibility that slag inclusions or incomplete fusion will result. Um, then go ahead and drop down to, saying in that second column, drop down to the next to last paragraph and highlight it, it says for those welding operations requiring interpass temperature control, the welding operator may need to monitor this aspect of the process as well. Just as with the preheat, the interpass temperature could be specified as a minimum, a maximum, or both. The interpass temperature should also be measured on the base metal surface near the weld zone and not in the weld joint itself, just like we talked about before, three inches away. And some of the codes will address what they call interrupted welding. Like, like I just talked about, uh, okay, it's lunchtime, they've, they've quit, they've gone to lunch, and now they've come back and, then, and they've been gone for an hour and they're getting all set up again, getting ready to weld again. Well, are they going to violate that welding procedure if that welding procedure says that the joint has to be at a certain temperature before they start welding again? 
as the inspector, it's a good time to, to, to stand back there and make sure that they pick up that rosebud and, and they go ahead and they, they preheat it again up to the proper temperature before they start welding. So uh, that would be an interrupted weld. And some of them, some codes will allow it, some codes don't. Some codes say no more than a five minute delay. Some codes say, well, just bring it back up to the, to the prescribed temperature. But you gotta watch them afterwards until that weld is complete to make sure that they, they don't violate the, uh, any preheat or, or interpass temperature requirements on the welding procedure. Um, okay, go ahead and flip to page 1010. In the first column, right above those uh, staggered intermittent fillet welds that we see there, it says, highlight this, is when full penetration groove welds are designed to be welded from both sides, there must be some method of gouging the weld root of the first side prior to welding the second. The welding inspector should examine the back gouge surface prior to the welding of the second side. If this is not done, there is a possibility that slag inclusions or other dis discontinuities won't be removed and uh, would then be included in the finished weld. And again, a, a good welder is going to take it upon himself or herself to, to do that own monitoring. I mean, you're your own best inspector, but once more, some welders are lazy and, and they just want to get the job done. So those are the ones you have to watch. Drop down to the next paragraph, put a bullet, highlight it. it says, while most of these items monitored during welding are really the responsibility of the welder, it is still important that the welding inspector check to assure that the welder understands the welding requirements and follows instructions adequately. Now that's just a polite way of saying what I just said. Uh, you want to your presence will, will, will keep, keep the people honest uh, and it will keep them doing it the correct way. So you have to be visible when you're being an inspector. The well inspector usually has a better grasp of the overall quality expected so he or she can more easily spot problems and initiate corrective action. And a lot of times, I'm not saying you can't talk to the welders, uh, a lot of times I, I, I do, we'll discuss their work, but you can't really give them any orders, you have to go through the chain of command. Drop down to the uh, next paragraph, it says, highlight, it says, in general, visual inspection after welding consists of looking at the appearance of the finished weld. And uh, this visual exam will detect surface discontinuities in the weld and base metal. Of special importance during this aspect of the welding inspection is the evaluation of the weld's profile. Sharp surface irregularities can result in premature failure to, uh, of that component during service. These visual features are evaluated in accordance with the applicable codes, blah, blah, blah. And here's our slide. Here's what you're going to look for afterwards. You're going to examine weld appearance, check the weld size and length, check the parts for dimensional, uh, anything being out, outside of what's accepted by the, by the print. So di dimensional tolerances. Uh, monitor any other NDE methods that may have to follow on that, uh, X-ray, UT, PT, mag particle you may be required to, to monitor that. Doesn't mean you have to be uh, uh, certified, but you have to understand what, what that certified person is doing. Uh, any, then you have to monitor any post-weld heat treatment and prepare inspection reports. Did everything go according to plan? In, in your best judgment, was this well done to the highest quality? And uh, that's your responsibility. Here's a, a set of visual inspection tools. Those of you that uh, are taking this class have come on campus and probably use those by now. If not, you'll be using them soon. And at that time, we'll go over all of these things. Um, fillet weld gauges, weld reinforcement gauges, calipers, uh, temp sticks, micrometers, high-low gauges, um, undercut gauges, and so forth. And uh, we, we devote one entire class to just learning how to use those and actually applying those. Then on page 1011, I highlighted that entire first column. And at the top of that first column, it says, in the case of fillet wells, the size determination is normally accomplished with the aid of a fillet weld gauge. Uh, there are numerous types of gauges which can be used, including gauges or templates, which are especially specifically made for use on on a particular fillet weld configuration. Uh, one common type of fillet weld gauge consists of a series of sheet metal templates which have been maintained to, uh, pardon me, machine to produce two different types of cutouts. On those fillet weld gauges, one side measures the leg of the, of the fillet weld and the other side measures the throat. And uh, 
as I said, we'll go get into that a little more thoroughly, but briefly, let me see if I can give you an idea here. Bear with me, I'm not much of an artiste. It may look something like that, and then over on this side it would come down and something like that. Now, this might be, say, one quarter of an inch from, from that point to that point. And what you'll do is you'll hold that up to the fillet weld, and that will, and, and if this leg, here's your fillet weld, and it's going to come down like this. And if that's a one quarter inch fillet weld gauge, then if, if the fillet weld fits underneath there, you know that it's less than a quarter of an inch. And then this other end would be used to, to check the throat. And on this one, it comes, it, it, it would butt in like that and come out and have a little point like that. And then that checks, checks the throat thickness. So there's, there's a special technique that we use for using these fillet weld gauges. And just bear in mind that, that some people have the misunderstanding that the fillet weld's got to fill this entire area. Well, it, it doesn't. It's just a, it's a linear measurement from, from here to here. And you know, that could be a quarter of an inch or three eighths of an inch or whatever. And also on these gauges, you'll see a, a, usually there's a red line here that would, so it shows a quarter of an inch here and a quarter of an inch here. So again, if you haven't taken that class already, if you haven't come out on campus to learn how to use those things, you will. And we'll get some practice with those to prepare you for taking the part B of the exam. Now staying on 1011, uh, here's an example. Uh, this is the same picture you have in your book. Here they're, ch they're checking the throat. And here's that, here's that little red line I was talking about. Here they're checking the toe. And again, here's that little red line. This looks like a 5 eighths, uh, eighths of an inch. I can read this one. And what they've done is they've set it down flat on this piece of steel, and they pushed it in until this, this top part touches this piece of steel. And if that fillet weld fits within that area, then you know that it is less than 5 eighths of an inch. And the rule of thumb is, if this did not fit in there, you would go to the next size larger. Um, again, it, it, it just depends on the tolerances you're allowed. You could go, the, the rule of thumb is to go 25% larger, uh, but sometimes you can't go any smaller. So again, you have to check and, and see what it is. So there's two ways of measuring them. You measure them by the, by, the, uh, by the leg, and you measure them by the throat. And they're actually defined by the largest uh, isosceles triangle that can be fit within there. So most people go by, by the throat to determine the weld size. So let's, let's read from your book. Again, I'm in the first column on page 1011. Uh, I'm reading the paragraph right above figure 1013. It says, since fillet weld sizes are designated as nominal dimensions, there should realistically be a tolerance applied to this measurement. Since commercially available gauges are typically graduated in 1 16th of an inch increments, it would be reasonable to gauge fillet weld sizes to the closest 1 32nd. Conditions warrant such an approach include the difficulty in positioning your eyes properly to view the gauge, the fact that weld sizes cannot be thought of in terms of typical machining precision, gauge and precision, base and weld metal uh, surface irregularities, and the difficulty in determining the exact location of the toe of a convex fillet weld. Uh, it, all of this illustrates the template type gauge being used to measure a fillet weld, and this is the type of gauge used on the CWI practical exam. Now this next paragraph I highlight and put a bullet by, when measuring a fillet weld, the weld size is determined by the size of the li largest isosceles right triangle which can be totally contained within the weld's cross section. So that depends on whether it's convex or concave. Um, so you can't really go by the, by the leg size because if it's, if it's concave, then the throat's going to be a lot smaller. Um, this, using these fillet weld gauges, and, and, and your, 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 your book alludes to some of the problems that you have in, in using those. And the CWI practical exam is the hardest part of the exam. And it's because of this ambiguity. Sometimes you can't really read the, the weld replicas that they're, that they're using. Um, 
there might be a casting defect. There might be a, a little excess piece of plastic on there from the molding process. And you're looking at that going, well, that doesn't look right. And so you measure it and then you answer it based on that and, and you have no clue that it was a casting fault. And so, and so uh, uh, you're gonna miss that question. More people fail the practical part, part B, than they do any, any of the others. And you have to bear in mind that if you fail one, you fail them all. Uh, so if you fail the one, you're not going to get your CWI. Um, the best thing you can do is, is become good at using these measuring tools and, and eliminating the obviously wrong answers and then taking your best guess at the remaining answers. So make sure that you do get on campus and you have the opportunity to practice using these things. We'll do them once uh, in learning how to, how to use them and then we'll do them a second time when we go through our part B of the class. Uh, staying in that second column, drop down to the next paragraph, bullet, highlight it, says, as mentioned above, when using the sheet metal template type gauges, the two different shapes of cutouts will be used depending upon whether the fillet weld profile is convex or concave. Once the inspector decides which profile is present, he or she selects that shaped template for the weld size which is specified. If the weld is convex, the proper gauge shape will actually be measuring the leg dimensions. Let's see. Okay, so you have to determine, is it convex or concave? And then you have to use the correct template gauge. So are you gonna use the throat or are you gonna use the leg one? Estimate between the gauge sizes. Measure to the nearest 1 32nd or 1 16th of an inch and measure the smallest region of the fillet weld. So like I tell my students, uh, a lot of times they'll show me a, a, a fillet weld that they've made on a T-joint and I, I stress to them consistency. It's got to be the same width, it's got to be the same thickness. And if they bring it to me and I look at it and I say, well now, if I, were t if I were testing this, I'd have to measure it from the thinnest region and that might not meet what we want. It's just, and I use the analogy of a chain. A fillet weld is only as strong as its thinnest area, just like a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. And that kind of fixes it in their mind that they have to be consistent. And as the inspector, you're going to look for that smallest region and that's where you're going to take your measurement from. Okay. Let's go ahead and flip the page. A couple of things on page 10, 12 I'd like you to highlight. In the first column, next to last paragraph, highlight that. It says there may also be requirements relating to the post-weld stress relief or other heat treatment, treatments which are specified to modify the as-welded properties of the weldment. The weld inspector may be responsible for monitoring of these thermal treatments as well. If so, the operation must be performed in accordance with written procedures or code requirements. So that, as the inspector, you would have to make sure that whatever heat treatment company is coming out to your site to do that, that, that they do have a proper procedure, their equipment is calibrated, they're meeting all the code requirements. Over in the ne next column, highlight the last paragraph. It says, as has been discussed, visual inspection comprises the basic element of any welding quality control program. Although quite simple, this method is capable of finding most of the discontinuities which result from the welding operation. Uh, however, visual inspection is limited to the discovery of surface irregularities. That's a bullet. Therefore, it must be done at all phases of the fabrication sequence to provide adequate coverage. In general, there are certain responsibilities of the welding inspector which are due to be performed before, during, and after the welding operation. When properly applied, visual inspection is able to detect problems when they occur, which greatly reduces the costs associated with the correction of those defects. With this background on visual testing completed, we'll now look at the next phase of weld inspection. Okay, that takes care of, care of VT. Now to continue with uh, module 10, we're on page 10, 12, uh, non-destructive testing. And what's our definition of non-destructive testing? Method of testing to evaluate quality uh, and not affect end user serviceability. So we're not going to damage the part in any way. Uh, and there's quite a few of them. Your book talk, talks about the big five, but all of them have a few things in, in common. Uh, they'll have a source of probing energy of some type, and you'll see this in the blue box that is on page 1013, the first blue box. A source of probing energy. 
It could be radiation, it could be sound waves, it could be a, a liquid uh, or magnetism. Those are all sources of probing energy. Now what happens is any discontinuities that that probing energy encounters will alter the energy. Uh, the detection of energy alteration is what occurs and the indication of the energy alteration will show up and then you're going to record and evaluate any indications. And those are all in that first blue box. Um, what are the main types? You should, you should know these definitions. PT for penetrant testing, MT for magnetic particle testing, radiographic or RT for x-ray, ultrasonic, UT, and eddy current, ET. And we'll talk a little bit about each one, but this is by no means all of them, but it's the main ones. So, over on page 1013, right below the second uh, blue box, highlight it where it says, first, the welding inspector should be aware of the advantages and limitations of these methods. Uh, this will assist in deciding which test method, pardon me, which test might be used to provide some additional information about the apparent quality of a material or weld. In that way, uh, visual evaluation can be further substantiated by some additional testing. Knowledge of the advantages and limitations will also help in determining if the non-destructive testing specialist doing the actual testing is applying the test properly. Uh, since the welding inspector may be called on to monitor the performance of or maintain records about these tests, this knowledge should aid in understanding the results. So I've worked with some inspectors that have insisted that the, uh, the testing specialist Usually they're, they'll come out and they'll have a big old folder that shows their certificates that they're certified to ASNT, blah, blah, blah. Um, I've worked with some inspectors who are very, very critical uh, of the accuracy of those certifications. So depending on, again, how, uh, how critical the weldman is, you, you're going to want to verify that, uh, that the uh, person performing the test is currently certified, that it ha their, their certification under ASNT hasn't lapsed any. Turn to page 1014, PT. Penetrate testing. Under penetrate testing, uh, what does penetrate testing do? It looks for surface discontinuities only. It relies on penetrate bleed out. It magnifies the discontinuity size, and there's several different methods. So you're going to want to know these highlights. So under, under uh, penetrate testing, highlight that and put a bullet that says, in general terms, penetrate, penetrate testing reveals surface discontinuities by the bleed out of penetrating medium against a con contrasting colored background. Uh, a little further type down it says uh, there are two primary ways in which penetrant materials are grouped, specifically the type of indications produced and the method of excess penetrant removal. The two penetrant indications are visible and fluorescent. So we have two types, visible and fluorescent. The visible dye, usually red, produces a vivid red indication against a white developer background when viewed under white light. The fluorescent penetrant produces a greenish fluorescent indication against a light background when observed under ultraviolet or black light. Since the human eye can more readily perceive a fluorescent indication than a visible indication, use of a fluorescent penetrant can result in a more sensitive test. Uh, then the second way in which penetrants are categorized refers to the method by which excess penetrant is removed from the test surface. This can be water washable, solvent removable, post emulsifiable. Water washable penetrants contain an emulsifier which allows the oily penetrant to be rinsed off the surface with a low pressure water spray. Solvent removable penetrants require solvent to remove the penetrant, surface penetrant from the test object and post emulsifiable penetrants are removed by adding a emulsifier after the dwell time. The application of this emulsifier to, to the penetrant on the test surface permits it to be removed with water in the same manner as the water washable type. Uh, and all of those things are indicated in the blue box. Now let's go to the steps. The first step, and you should note these things, is to clean the surface. So you want to clean it up, and usually a, a test kit will have a cleaner, a, a dye and a developer. So you're going to spray that part, you're going to clean it up real good, scrub it, get everything off there that you're going to, that you need to do. Then, once the, uh, the part is clean, you're going to apply the penetrant. Now if you look up page 1015, top of the column, they talk about that. It says, once the surface is suitably clean and has been allowed to dry, so you have to have a clean, dry surface, then you apply the penetrant. 
On small parts, this can be done by dipping them into a bath of penetrant. On larger parts, the penetrant can be applied by spraying or brushing. The penetrant is allowed to remain on the test surface uh, for a period between 5 minutes and 30 minutes, and this time is referred to as the dwell time. That's a bullet, the dwell time. The exact length of this dwell time depends upon the penetrant manufacturer's recommendations, the temperature of the part, and the size of the discontinuities that you're looking for. So dwell time varies with the nature of the job, typically in the range of 2 to 20 minutes or longer in special cases. Now your book, of course, says 5 to, five to 30 minutes, but uh, I've, I've seen these numbers on, on the cans that, that that stuff comes in, so take your pick. Uh, and then the penetrant is drawn into tiny cracks through capillary action. Now, when you have excess penetrant, you can, you can put too much on there. And you'll notice this slide has a big circle with a slash through it and it says no. So what they're doing here is they're removing excess penetrant by spraying a cleaner back on it again. Well, you don't want to do that because if you just spray a cleaner directly back onto the part, what's going to happen? you're going to wash the dye out of all of the indications that you wanted it to be absorbed into. So you don't ever spray a cleaner right back on it like that. Proper way to clean it is to spray your cleaner onto a rag and then you're going to take that rag and you're going to remove the excess penetrant by wiping in one direction. Wipe it in one direction. So again reading from your book right above uh, still in the first column page 1015 right above that figure 1016 it says once the excess penetrant has been removed, a developer is applied. It can be a dry powder or a powder suspended in a volatile liquid which readily evaporates, leaving the powder on the surface. It is important that the developer be applied in a thin, uniform layer. In fact, a good technique is to apply the developer in several very thin layers, allowing a couple of minutes between excessive developer applications to avoid excessive developer buildup. A thick layer of developer can mask very small indications. So once we've cleaned it, it's dried, we've applied the, the, uh, the dye, now we, we, we have we removed any excess penetrant, then our next step is to apply the developer. And it says in this example, spray can, the, the spray can is too close to the weld surface, which can lead to excessive developer on the surface. You should keep it at a distance of 10 to 12 inches away. And then here, this is excess developer, and you can see how it has run on the part and you don't have that particular slide in your book but you can see what they're trying to get across here you can put too much developer on there and it will mask the parts that the, the, the flaws that you're trying to find and then your book continues reading I'm reading from the second paragraph here it says this developer draws penetrant out of any surface discontinuities to create a contrasting indication in much the same manner that an absorbent material soaks up liquid this bleed out, that's a bullet, this bleed out magnifies tiny discontinuities to provide indications which can be easily seen. The discontinuity indication can then be evaluated as to whether it is considered to be detrimental. When using a visible dye penetrant, the evaluation is done under white light, whereas use of fluorescent penetrants will require the evaluation be performed under ultraviolet light. Um, and then this, you have this picture on, your, on the next page. If you flip the page, you'll see it up in the upper right-hand corner. And in our example, we found porosity, a transverse crack, another transverse crack here, and then a toe crack. Uh, to me, these transverse cracks look like they might be a little, little bit of trap slag. I don't know that I'd call them cracks, but uh, that's what our slide is calling them. Um, then, still reading from page... Uh, 1015, it says there are numerous advantages which can be gained when using penetrant testing. It says, uh, your book says that it's relatively simple, you can use it on all types of metals, it's quite sensitive, and it's quite portable. And next to visual inspection, this may be, uh, I would probably rank this third. Rank this third uh, after mag particle, which we'll get to next. So read about the advantages, then flip the page. Now we're on page 1016. Limitations. Limitations begin in the uh, first column, second paragraph. It says, among the limitations of penetrant testing is the most prominent one, the fact that it will not detect subsurface discontinuities. It's also somewhat slow, limited to the surface, and you have to have a smooth surface. So know about the uh, limitations. 
Then down at the bottom of that column, it says the equipment required to perform penetrant testing is relatively simple and may consist only of a penetrant, cleaner, lint-free rags, developer, and if required, an emulsifier. You need a good white light source, uh, blah, blah, blah. Then over in the next column, it says once an indication has been discovered, it can be permanently recorded using photography or sketches. The indication can also be lifted off the test surface and transferred to a test report uh, form using a transparent plastic tape. So sketches, photographs, and uh, lift off tapes. And then finally, when you're all done, you're going to clean the part. It says uh, post inspection removal of developer, de developer residues may be required, particularly if, work, if the workpiece is to be welded, uh, repaired, or painted. And why? Because hazardous fumes can result. It says, uh, the last paragraph there reads, striking an arc on a surface containing these materials not only affects weld quality, but it can also result in the formation of noxious or even hazardous fumes, which can create a serious safety hazard for personnel. So, um, that's our discussion of, of, of PT. Here on campus now, I will be, we, we, we will be performing PT and mag particle and, and going a little more in depth. Um, so if you get an opportunity to make sure you can come on campus to have some exposure to that if you've never done it before. Uh, our next topic is going to be mag particle testing, magnetic particle testing. We're on page 1016. And it says this particular non-destructive test method is used primarily to discover surface discontinuities in ferromagnetic materials. While indications can be observed from subsurface discontinuities very near the surface, they are very difficult to interpret and offer, often require testing by other methods. So, uh, MT principles, a flaw-oriented transverse to magnetic flux creates poles of opposite signs at the edges of the flaw, and they're very attractive to, magnetic, to the iron particles. Uh, mag particle testing, to do this, you're going to magnetize the parts, iron particles will be sprinkled onto it, and they will accumulate at a flaw. Uh, this magnifies the flaw size, and it is a relatively quick process. So this is a pretty fast process, and that's why I think it's a little more popular than, than PT. PT is relatively slow, but nevertheless it works pretty well. Um, aspects, aspects of a magnet. It says, to understand particle testing, I'm reading from the next to last paragraph in the second column on page 1016. It says, to understand magnetic particle testing, it is necessary to have some basic knowledge of magnetism. Therefore, it is appropriate to describe some of its important characteristics. To begin this discussion, refer to figure 1019, which shows a diagram of the magnetic field associated with a bar magnet. It says, looking at this diagram, there are several principles of magnetism which are demonstrated. Um, the first is are the magnetic lines of force or magnetic flux lines, which tend to travel from pole, from one end of the pole of the magnet to the opposite end. Uh, the magnetic flux lines form continuous loops, which travel from one pole to the other in a single direction. These lines always remain virtually parallel to one another and will never cross each other. Finally, the force of these flux lines is greatest when they are totally contained within a ferrous or magne ma magnetic material. Although they will travel across some air gap, their intensity is reduced significantly. So you have magnetic lines of flux, or your magnetic field. They have north and south poles. Always remember that like signs of poles repel. Opposite signs attract. And the flux lines are parallel to, it, to each other. They don't cross. Um, magnet, magnetic fields are produced two ways, using permanent magnets. And uh, figure 1019 is a permanent bar magnet, figure 1020 is a, a horseshoe magnet, and then they have electromagnets, uh, direct current, alternating current, and half-wave rectified AC electromagnets. Uh, what is an electromagnet? A current-carrying carry, current carrying conductor creates a magnetic flux around the conductor and perpendicular to the current flow. Uh, here's our horseshoe magnet, and so we have a north and south pole, and because they're clamping it down to this piece of steel, that magnetic, those magnetic lines of flux continue through uh, the, the part being tested. Now the discontinuity is interrupting and you'll notice that the, the discontinuity is transverse to those lines of force and so that changes the poles. 
And so we have a south and a north pole, a south and a north pole. So how do you do mag particle? Um, go to uh, the second column on page 1017, and it says, to perform magnetic particle testing, there must be some means of generating a magnetic field in the test piece. Once the part has been magnetized, iron particles are sprinkled on the surface. If discontinuities are present, these particles will be attracted and held in place to provide a visual indication. The examples discussed so far have, de have depicted permanent magnets. However, use of permanent magnets or magnetic particle testing is done in infrequently. Most magnetic particle testing uses electromagnetic equipment. An electromagnet relies on the principle that there is a magnetic field associated with any electrical conductor as shown in figure 1021. When electricity is passed through a conductor, the magnetic field which is developed is oriented perpendicular to the direction of the electricity. Uh, there are two general types of magnetic fields which are created in test objects using uh, electromagnetism. Um, I guess I got ahead of myself a little bit. Let me see what my next slide is. This is the figure that's in your, in your book. You can just think of this as your welding lead. In your welding lead, electricity is flowing and there is a magnetic field associated with that. So that's a, that's a real simple principle of it. Now what they can do here, this is also in your book, this is on page 1018. Um, this is longitudinal magnetism. What they've done is they have taken this piece of pipe here and they have looped a coil around it, passed electricity through it, and that has created a magnetic field. And then if you look at this, it shows that lines of force are, are about the electrical conductor and cracks at 45 degrees to those lines of force will show up. Cracks at 90 degrees to the lines of force will show up. But cracks that run parallel to those lines of force will not show up. So in order for a uh, uh, mag particle to work, uh, you have to take and test the piece in two directions, 90 degrees apart. That's the only way you could detect uh, any defects, all of the defects that would be present in a part. Um, this is a picture of a headshot. This is a headshot. That would be your figure 1023, circular magnetism. Now, you don't have this in your book, but what they've done here is they've got, they've got a, an electrical lead clamped here and then a conductor going, passing through this pipe and, and then another lead coming out here. So they've electrified this pipe and they've set up a magnetic field inside it. And this is, this is a photograph of what you're seeing in figure 1023. So they've electrified the part and it's setting up circular lines of force and, and then they could de detect cracks at 90 degrees to those, cracks at 45 degrees to those, but these cracks would not show up because they are running with the lines of force. So again, let's read from your book. As in the first column it says figure 1022. Let me go back to that. 10, uh, figure 1022, which is this particular picture, uh, illustrates a typical longitudinal magnetic field created by surrounding the part with a coiled electrical conductor. When using a stationary magnetic particle testing machine, this would be referred to as a coil shot. That's a bullet. When electricity passes through this conductor, a magnetic field is created as shown. And it says, uh, with this magnetic field, flaws uh, lying perpendicular to the lines of force will easily be revealed. You can see those at 45 degrees, but you cannot see those that, that run parallel to them. And then it says, uh, the other type of magnetic field is referred to as circular magnetism to create this field. The part to be tested becomes the electric conductor so that the induced magnetic field uh, tends to surround the part per perpendicular to the longitudinal axis. And this is called a head shot. So remember uh, coil shot and head shot. With circular magnetism, longitudinal flaws will be revealed while those lying transverse will not. Um, go over to the uh, next page. Pardon me, not the next page, but the next column. In the middle of that next column, then, we start talking about yokes. And magnetic particle equipment, we have AC and DC bench units, AC yokes, AC-DC yokes, AC-DC prods, and AC-DC coils. And this is a yoke. And it says both types of magnetic fields can also be generated in a part using portable equipment. A longitudinal field results when the yoke method is used. And this is the, probably the one you're going to see the most often, using this little yoke. So that's a bullet. Know what a yoke is. 
A yoke unit is an electromagnet and is made by winding a coil around a soft magnetic material core. Current flowing through the coil induces a magnetic field which flows across the test object between the ends of the yoke. Uh, to produce a circular magnetic field with a portable unit, the prod technique is used. Use of the, uh, this method for weld testing is illustrated in figure 10.25, and that's that same picture. This guy looks like he's something out of the 1950s, but <laughs> I'm going to date myself here. I've actually seen that piece of equipment, not that particular one, but one just like that. And that was about 1980, so the picture may not be as old as it looks. Um, Either alternating AC or direct current can be used to induce a magnetic field. The magnetic field created by alternating current is the strongest at the surface of the test object. AC current will provide greater particle mobility on the surface of the part, allowing the particles to move about more freely, which aids in flaw detection. So you may get a question to the effect is which is going to be more sensitive, AC, using AC or using DC? So that would be your answer right in there. Go to the next page, uh, second paragraph, it says uh, in the first column, it has been stated that magnetic particle testing is most sensitive to discontinuities perpendicular to the magnetic lines of force, flux, and that discontinuities parallel to the lines of flux might not be detected at all. At angles between these extremes is a gray area. In general, if the acute angle formed between the lines of flux and the long axis of the discontinuity is greater than 45 degrees, the discontinuity will form an indication. At angles less than 45 degrees, the discontinuity may not be detected. And this is a bullet. Therefore, to provide complete evaluation of the part, to locate flaws lying in all directions, it is necessary to apply the magnetic fields in two directions, 90 degrees apart. Um, okay, go to the next uh, column. It says, equipment. Equipment used with this test method varies in size, portability, and expense. You have a uh, lightweight AC yokes, uh, you have the prods that we've talked about, uh, and then stationary units, which include demagnetization mechanisms. Then at the bottom, bottom of the uh, second column, it says the iron particles used are very small and are often dyed to provide a vivid color contrast with that of the test object. Colors commonly available include gray, white, red, yellow, blue, and black. These are called visible particles and are used under a strong visible light source. Iron particles can also be obtained that are fluorescent under black light, and their sensitivity is greater. Um, let's see. The advantages. This is in the next paragraph. It says that I'm reading near the end, near the bottom of that next paragraph. It says the advantages of MT are rapid testing speeds and low cost. The method can be made extremely portable and is very good for the detection of surface discontinuities. Testing can be done through thin paint coatings. So it's very rapid, it's very sensitive, low cost, and it's portable. In the next paragraph, it talks about the limitations. A uh, major limitation of magnetic particle testing is that it can only be used on materials that can be magnetized. Other limitations are that most parts require demagnetization after testing, and that very thick coatings may mask detrimental indications. Demagnetization is usually done by the AC method and is done by either removing the part from the magnetizing field slowly or reducing the induced magne magnetizing current applied to the part to zero. Um, and then finally, how do we do the results? Again, sketches, photographs, and lift off tapes so that you can have a permanent record of it. Okay, at this point, if I had you in class, I would be asking if there were any questions, but since not, we'll go on to radiographic. So, radiographic testing. Still on page 20 now. Uh, bullet. Based on the principle of preferential radiation transmission or absorption. So, reading from your book, it says radiography is a non destructive test method based on the principle of preferential radiation transmission or absorption. Areas of reduced thickness or lower density transmit more and therefore absorb less radiation. The radiation which passes through a test object will form a contrasting image on a film receiving the radiation. So radiation absorption, uh, the thicker a piece or the higher the density of material absorption absorbs more radiation, resulting in less transmission to the film. It's, it's really very simple. If, uh, let's, let's stay here with the slides and, and take a look at this wedge. It's called a step wedge. 
and they'll use it to, to, to help determine uh, uh, the density on a, on a film. And, and here we have the thickest part, and we have our source up above it, and the source is passing radiation into, the, uh, into this uh, calibration block. And here at the thicker part, less radiation is passing through the thicker part, therefore the film is not exposed as much, and it stays light. Here where it steps down a little bit, a little more radiation passes through and so the film becomes a little darker. Over here again, it's cut in half again and now the film is darker. And here at the thinnest part of this step wedge, the film becomes the, the, the darkest. So you can see the thickness of the material has an effect on how much radiation goes through it to the, uh, to the film. Well, that's one, one thing that affects it. The other thing that affects it is densities. Now here we have grams per cubic centimeter. Aluminum will, will weigh 2.70 grams per cubic centimeter. All the way, if you take a look at lead, 11.34 grams per cubic centimeter. Well, that's just, that's just a way, a formula of showing you which, is, which has the, the denser, which material is packed more tightly. So PB means lead, that's, that's the chemical designation for lead. And now you'll notice all of these blocks are the same thickness, but their densities are different. So with lead being the thickest one here, you can see that it's really a light area. Then we have copper, and it's a little darker because it's not quite, copper's not as dense as lead. And then we have steel, or iron rather, and you can see uh, iron is not as, as dense as copper, and so more, more uh, rays are passing through the film. And then aluminum has the lightest amount of density, and so that's the one that allows the most amount of radiation to pass through. And so we go from, because they're all the same thicknesses, but the densities are different, we go from lighter to darker, and that's all directly related to the amount of radiation that can pass, pass through the object and reach the film. Okay, radiation sources. Now, you should have gotten some handouts that detail some of this stuff. These are the two most common that I've worked with, iridium-192 and cobalt-60, but we can also produce uh, radiation through an x-ray machine. You should have in your packet um, a schematic of, a, of an x-ray tube, what that looks like, and also a, a handout that describes the half-life of iridium, the half-life of cobalt, and some other ones. So there's two sources. We can have gamma radiation, and these are called pills. That, uh, it, would be a, it would be the actual source is about an eighth of an inch in diameter, and they call it a pill, or uh, from an x-ray machine. Now, before I get ahead of myself, this is, this is what an x-ray tube looks like. And you can notice here, they've, this is brick. It's, just, it's mounted to the ceiling in a brick building. And so they're, they're putting their stuff down here on their focal point. They're shooting a voltage through here. It's, the voltage is bouncing off of a, 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 it's a, it's a tungsten target where it shears off uh, electrodes, and those electrodes lose an eon or an ion, and, creates radiation and passes through the film. If you look at 1021, it says x-rays are man-made. Well, let me, let me go a little higher. Let's go to the first paragraph. It says lower energy non-particulate radiation is in the form of either gamma radiation or x-rays. Gamma rays are the result of the decay of radioactive materials. Common radioactive sources include iridium-192, cesium-137, and cobalt-60. These sources are constantly emitting radiation and must be kept in a shielded storage container referred to as a gamma camera. Um, camera is one word that they use, they also call them projectors. Uh, and, and these containers usually empty, employ lead and steel shielding, they weigh about 50 pounds, they're pretty heavy. Uh, X-rays are man-made, they're produced when electrons traveling at high speed collide, collide with matter, that matter is your tungsten target. The conversion of electrical energy to X radiation is achieved in an evacuative tube. A low current is passed through an incandescent filament to produce electrons. Application of a high potential between the filament and a target metal accelerates electrons across this voltage differential. Uh, the action of an electron stream striking the target produces X-rays. Radiation is, a, is produced only while voltage is applied to the X-ray tube. So once the voltage stops, there's no more X-rays being produced. When using gamma or X-ray sources, the test object is not radioactive following the test. So once the source is removed, radiation stops. Um, let's see. So 
Before we get to that, let's go uh, subsurface discontinuities, which are readily detectable by this method, are those having different densities than the material being radi radiated. This includes voids, metallic or non-metallic inclusions, and favorably aligned incomplete fusion or cracks. And you notice they, they specifically say favorably aligned because the location of your so source is important in uh, being able to detect um, lack of fusion or cracks. And, and the reason for that is you, you, you can imagine if we had a sandwich. If I had a sandwich like this and, and I held it up to, to an x-ray source and I put my source through there and I shot it, well, you're not going to know it's layered in there. But if I turn it up on edge like this and now I shot it, now you're going to see that crack where the two slices of bread come together. Same way with an x-ray. Uh, if, if you don't have that source lined up exactly right to where those rays are passing through that void where your lack of fusion or your crack is, then it's not going to pick it up. So it does have that limitation. So how do we do it? Well, you're going to position the radiation source. You're going to position the film behind the object, expose the radiation, develop the film, and then you're going to evaluate it. And that's the way we do it. So go ahead and read that entire page, 1021, so you'll know a little bit about that. On the second column, let's talk about um, image quality indicators. Uh, doesn't look like I'm quite there yet. So film density versus flaws. The darker film zones, you're going to see cracks, slags, and porosity. Well, why? Because there's nothing there to, to, to absorb or, or stop the, the transmission of radiation. Passes through a crack, unimpeded, passes through slag, passes through porosity, which is a void, and will pass completely through incomplete joint penetration. And so it darkens more film. More, more radiation is reaching the film. However, tungsten is a, is a really dense material, and so it, it absorbs and stops a lot of the radiation. Melt-through or excessive reinforcement, thicker areas. So again, it's, it's blocking more radiation from reaching the film, and so those areas will be lighter. Equipment, you've got to have a radiation source. This is in the second column, second paragraph. The equipment required to perform radiographic testing begins with a source of radiation. And that's either going to be an x-ray machine or a gamma radiation source. You need a radiation monitor or a survey meter. You need film holders. Uh, film holders are, uh, are, are packets that you would, would uh, put the film in. using. Uh, you would put the film in between a couple of lead sheets to cut down on scatter. Uh, you would position it. You would put an IQI uh, really close to the area you want to inspect so you can tell the, uh, the quality of the image that you're getting. Uh, a densitometer, uh, uh, film density strips, a film processing machine, or you could use the tanks and do it the old-fashioned way, which most trucks, these x-ray trucks you see driving around, that's what they have, and then a film viewer. So that's the equipment. And that's all noted in, in the second column. Uh, and then it talks about IQIs. These are image quality indicators. Let me read from your book. It says, you notice it says 1T hole, 2T hole, and 4T hole, and down here it has 10, 15, and 25. Uh, reading from your book, it says image quality indicators or penetrometers, also known as pennies, are used to verify the resolution sensitivity of the test. These IQIs are usually one of two types, either the hole type, which is what I have up on the board, or the wire type. They are both specified as to material type. In addition, the hole type will have a specified thickness and hole size, uh, while the wire type will have a specified wire diameter. Sensitivity is verified by the ability to detect a given difference in density due to the penetrometer thickness and hole diameter, or the wire diameter. Uh, figure 1028 shows both types of IQI or penetrometers. Figure 1029 shows the placement of the hole type IQI on a plate weld prior to radiography. Um, this is your wire, uh, wire image uh, quality indicator. And uh, if you flip the page, it says, hole penetrometers vary in thickness and hole diameters depending on the metal thickness being radiographed. Figure 1030, which is simply a blown up picture of this one here, um, shows the essential features of a number 25 IQI used by the ASME code. Its thickness and hole dimensions will be noted for illustration. Here, the penetrometer thickness is 0 0.025 inches. Hence the de designation number 25 uh, for the IQI thickness in mils. A number 10 would be 0. Point, pardon me, 0.010 inches. 
uh, thick, uh, number 50 would be 0 0.05 inches thick, and so forth. The hole diameters and positions are specified and are noted in terms of multipliers of the individual IQI. The largest hole in a number 25 IQI is 0 0.100, or uh, one tenth of an inch, and is called the 4T, uh, referring to the fact that it is equal to four times the thickness of the IQI. So what, whenever, we're shoot, whenever we make an x-ray, we're shooting for this hole, this, this hole type right here. But here, four T holes, so we know that this, this diameter is four times the thickness of this material. The two T is twice the thickness of this material. That one T is the same thickness as the material. Um, now, a two T hole is positioned farthest away from, from the lead number 25 and is equal to two times the IQI thickness. The smallest hole between the 4T and the 2T hole is referred to as the 1T hole and is, that, is exactly equal to the IQI thickness. These holes are used to verify film resolution sensitivity, which is usually specified to be 2% of the weld thickness. However, 1% sensitivity can also be specified, but is more difficult to attain. Uh, so, so what we're looking for is resolution, and we're basing it on these. And, and, and Typically, if you, can, if you can get an image that size, then uh, you can see any defects that size as well. Um, I talked a little bit before about the orientation of the, of the source. Here we have uh, the source, the, the uh, object being shot, and the film behind it. Now, I want you to notice how these rays expand out. Well, of course, this is an exaggeration, but it's, it's relevant because if you think of yourself and you're, you're walking outside in your front yard and the, and the sun is about, oh, it's past its zenith and it's getting on towards evening, you're going to cast a large shadow. Same thing happens with a source. And if the source is coming through like so and you've got a little indication there, it's going to make that indication on the film appear larger than it actually is. Now, if, it's, if it was directly down, it would be real close to its actual size. But again, if it's off to the side, it's going to make it appear larger. And they call that blow up. So you have, whenever you're reading film, you have to take into consideration the amount of blow up that uh, any discontinuity may have as a result of the placement of the source. Also, uh, if we had lack of fusion along either of these uh, fusion faces, it may not be able to pick it up because the source is directly above it. But if we place the source over here and shot it like that, where we're more aligned with the, the angle of the fusion face, we might be able to pick up some lack of fusion. <coughs> okay, advantages. Um, bottom of uh, column one on page 1022, major advantages of this method is that it can detect subsurface discontinuities in all common engineering products. So detect subsurface flaws, used for all materials. Film is a permanent record if it's stored properly. If it's stored improperly, it, um, it, get, it can really get messed up uh, through static electricity, as for, for one, one way of storing, messing it up. Uh, limitations, there's always a radiation hazard. You have to have access to both sides of the object being filmed. Uh, flaw orientation, so you want to make sure that you know where the source was placed in relation to the, to the uh, uh, weldment, uh, identification of, of the types of flaws, and then being able to properly interpret the film. Those are all some of the limitations. And then let's see. Results. This is on page 1023. It says, um, let's see. Well, I'm sorry. It, 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 this particular edition of our, of our text doesn't talk about what to do with the results, but you're going to have film, videotape, and sketches. That's how you can record the results on it. Okay. Which brings us to ultrasonic testing. UT, based on the propagation of sound waves through materials and the reflected echo from density changes. So read about that. Read about how uh, sound waves travel through the air as compared to steel and aluminum. At the bottom of that first column, um, well, first of all, principles of sound. 
Sound waves travel within a given material at a constant velocity, based in part on the material density. Sound waves will not travel in a vacuum. There are several types of sound waves. Longitudinal, which is a straight beam. Shear, which is an angle beam. And others not pertinent to welding inspection. Uh, at the bottom of that first column on page 1023, you'll notice in italics they have a, a, a piezoelectric effect. That refers to a material which can convert electrical energy to mechanical energy and vice versa. And how does that work? Well, the transducer accomplishes this energy conversion due to a phenomenon referred to as the piezoelectric effect. This occurs in several materials, both naturally occurring and man-made. Uh, quartz and ber uh, barium titanate are examples of piezoelectric materials of each type. And what happens is you, you, you induce, a, you, you put an electrical energy into it as, a, as applied voltage, and this material will change it to a mechanical energy in the sort, form of sound waves. And they shoot that into the part that's being tested, and then you record the results on a, on a uh, cathode ray tube. In the second column, Second paragraph, it says, to perform ultrasonic testing, the transducer is attached to an electronic base unit following a prescribed startup sequence and calibration procedure. Uh, this machine will generate precise electronic pulses, which are transmitted through a coaxial cable to the transducer, which has been placed in acoustic contact with the test object. And what that is, they'll use a couplant, and they'll put a couplant. It's usually kind of a, it's almost like brill cream, you know, or hair cream. And they'll put that on the surface and they'll put the transducer on that to get to eliminate any air pockets or anything like that. So they get a really good uh, connection there. And then they will uh, put these sound pulses into the material. It will go in, uh, strike the back wall or any discontinuities between itself and the back wall and then bounce, bounce back to you. Um, if you look here, the equipment you have to have, you have to have an electronic base unit, a piezoelectric transducer, calibration blocks, so that you can calibrate everything correctly. Uh, couple the probe with a couplant, carry out the testing and evaluate the signals. And you have this picture in your book. This is on page 1024. And here they're, they've got the transducer and they're calibrating it at one inch, then they calibrated it at two inches, then they calibrated it at three inches. And so they, they, they established what they call the main bang which is the, the first impulse coming back. And the main bang here on, on example A is at one inch. The main bang on this one is at two inches. The main bang at this one is on three inches. And they can read that across the cathode ray tube. And that's a, that's a bullet too. You need to know that, that uh, they use a cathode ray tube when they are doing this. Now, once you have calibrated it, uh, you're ready to go ahead and, and uh, perform your testing and the way that works is, here's your transducer. This is, you can see how blown, blown up this it is. They, they send the, uh, the, the sound waves down into the material, and it, and it will hit the back wall and come back to the transducer. Well, now they've timed this, and they know how long it's going to take it to go all the way down here and come back again. And just like your fish finder, if it bounces off of something that's not all the way down here on the bottom, that signal is going to come back faster. And so they can actually use this to locate defects in three dimensions. They call it a volumetric test, a truly volumetric test. They can find it in three dimensions. You need to remember that term, volumetric. You also uh, need to remember main bang. If you look on page 1024, top of the column, highlight main bang. Uh, that will probably be something on your test. And here we would have our main bang. Here is the result. Uh, or, or the back wall where it should be coming and then they've located this defect in between the two and you notice that, that the peak here is not not as large as, as, as either of these so that's how they they work it that's how they find it uh, staying in the second column put a bullet by where it says longitudinal waves or straight beam transducers are used to determine material thicknesses or the depth of a discontinuity below the material surface and then we have to talk about shear waves, put a bullet by, what, by that, shear wave or angle beam, and those are the two types. This is a person using, using this process. Now, again, this is not in your book, but he's got a, he's got a cathode ray tube right here, and, and you can see the main bang here, and I, I can actually see three peaks on here for the material that he's testing. You may not be able to see it on, on the camera there, but there are actually three peaks on that cathode ray tube that he's inspecting, so he's found a flaw. 
Um, this is how the angle beam would be used. This is also in your textbook. And you can see that they're going to work it back and forth in a W motion, and they're, they're bouncing it back underneath here, trying to check, check this weld. And it's coming in, bouncing up, just like a, a, a billiard ball on a pool table. And it's going to, it's going to bounce around through there. And once it's properly calibrated, you can see their, their main bang, the back wall, and then the defect in between it. Not their finding. Here's another picture. You don't have, uh, you have something similar to this in your book, but it's not, not quite the same thing. Uh, this one's using a 45 degree angle transducer. And they're sending out the sound waves and it's bouncing again. And it's coming back, passing through the weld and then back to the transducer again. And this one, they're doing the same thing, but now they've picked up a flaw. In this first one, they, they, they did not find any internal flaws. But on this one, now they have found an internal flaw, and the reflected echo is coming back a lot faster. So still on page 1024, um, the last paragraph, put a bullet there. It says, there are two general types of ultrasonic testing, contact and immersion. In contact testing, the transducer is actually placed against the surface of the part. Since the high-frequency sound is not readily transmitted through air, a liquid is placed between the test object and the transducer for improved contact. This liquid is referred to as a couplet, and that's a bullet. In immersion testing, the part to be evaluated is placed underwater, and the sound is transmitted from the transducer and into the part through the water. Contact testing has the advantage of being portable, while immersion, immersion pardon me, is not convenient for production testing of small or irregularly shaped uh, parts. And then over on the next page, uh, first column, the application of ultrasonic testing includes both surface and subsurface flaw detection. This method is most sensitive to planar discontinuities, especially those which are oriented perpendicular to the sound beam. We talked about laminations um, in steel last week. Well, those would be planar uh, indications. So laminations, cracks, incomplete fusion, inclusions, voids, it will find all of those. Uh, the equipment required for ultrasonic testing includes a cathode ray tube. Uh, and if you look at this slide here, it says, what are the advantages? We have, it's a truly volumetric test, as I've said. You can do it from one side. It's very accurate. Deep penetration. You can test material up to 200 inches thick. Uh, critical flaws are found and the equipment is fully portable. Uh, let's see. Vol your volumetric test is on page 1025, second column, second to last paragraph. It says one of the primary benefits of ultrasonic testing is that it is con considered to be a truly volumetric test. Um, so that's one of the main advantages. Another important advantage is that ultrasonic testing will best detect those more critical planar discontinuities such as cracking and incomplete fusion. Over on the next page, top of the first column, ultrasonic testing has deep penetration, ability up to 200 inches in steel, and can be very accurate. And then finally, the major limitations um, has to have a highly skilled operator, smooth surfaces, and the groove welds have to be more than one quarter of an inch thick. So, that's UT. It's very popular, becoming more so, uh, and I think in many ways it's, it's, it's better and more accurate than, than X-ray. Finally, we have uh, ultrasonic testing. We're on page 1026 now. Pardon me, eddy current testing. <clears throat> when a coil carrying AC is brought near a metal specimen, eddy currents are induced in the metal by electromagnetic induction. And they show us that in figure 10, uh, 1035. And excuse me one moment, I have to put on my other carousel. So um, eddy current, eddy current testing is based on the principle of eddy currents being formed in conductive materials in the presence of an AC coil and changes in those eddy currents uh, by, by the material changes. So that's what it is. And this picture is in your textbook. And you can see it has uh, 
induced conductive, uh, in this conductive material, it, it has induced some uh, magnetic field. And it says eddy current testing is highly versatile method. Uh, it can be used to measure the thickness. This is really cool. It can be used to measure the thickness of thin sections, electrical conductivity, magnetic permeability, hardness, and the heat treatment condition of test objects. Uh, so it, it, it's really cool because it's the only thing I know that can tell you what kind of heat treatment that material had been subjected to. That's all in the second column, pardon me, in the first column, second paragraph under our heading eddy current testing. So read that. Um, if the equipment is in the next paragraph and it says you need a base unit, cathode ray tube or meter, an AC probe, which is your coil and calibration standards. Um, these are some pictures of cathode ray tubes and the displays that you might see as you come across uh, different defects. Now I've never used eddy current and I've never seen eddy current done. What I know about it is that it can be a highly automated process and it's used in, in manufacturing shops quite a bit. Uh, but I have, to, I have to confess ignorance in, in, in ever having seen it done. <clears throat> the advantage is no contact is required with the part, no cup, coupling is required. It's readily automated and it's applicable to all metals. Limitations, you need a highly skilled operator. Sometimes it can be too sensitive in that it will give you false indications. Shallow penetration up to a 3 sixteenths of an inch thick. Calibration standards are required. It requires surface cleanliness and magnetic materials are more difficult for it to uh, be effective on. So that's eddy current. And um, our final topic is non-destructive examination symbols. So what about them? Non-destructive examination symbols, if you look through your book, you'll see that they're very similar to weld symbols. They're a shorthand notation. They're very useful, and they can be combined with uh, welding symbols through the use of uh, multiple tails or multiple reference lines. And here's what one would look like. Uh, you can look at that and you can see the number of examinations, uh, specification or other references in the tails, what side of it. So we still have an arrow side and another side, the length, of, the length to be examined, is it going to be done in the field, so forth. That's all in your, in your book. Um, probably this little blue box on page 1028 is what you should become most familiar with. Uh, these abbreviations, acoustic emission testing, eddy current testing, leak testing, which is one of the most uh, popular ones. It's cheap. It can be done with either air or water. Uh, magnetic particle testing, neutron radiography, never seen it, PT, proof testing, radiography, ultrasonic testing, and visual testing. So uh, if I had to give you some advice, I'd tell you to familiarize yourself with that blue box, the contents of that blue box. And that's the end of our slides, but a couple of other things I'd like to point out in your text. On page 1029 now, they've, they've given us a couple of examples. Uh, if you look at, at figure 1044, they show us a reference line and uh, RT eight places, UT two places, or it could be written as RT 25% of this, MT is 50% of that. Uh, over in the next column, look at your source. That is the, the symbol you're seeing there is an indication for a radiation source, and it's telling you the location of the source in relationship to uh, where the shot was made. And it's very important that you have that. Otherwise, you cannot properly read the film. If I've got, if I've got a weld here, and uh, I, have a, I have a film, and I see a torus, which, is, which would be the weld, and there's a, there's a defect right there. How do I know which side of the tube that's on? So you've so you got to know where the source was set, and, and then, then you can identify where, where that defect was. And so that's where those symbols would come in handy. OK. Um, one of the classes that we, we do here on, on campus will be a greater emphasis on how these tests are done. We'll do some PT, we'll do some mag particle, we'll do some, some x-ray. I don't have any UT equipment, so I can't demonstrate that, but we will do those other things. So uh, if you get an opportunity, come on campus, the, the dates and times that we do those things, and 
and uh, take a hand in that. It will help you understand a little bit better. Now under key terms and definitions on page 1030, put a bullet by bleed out, uh, capillary action, couplet, CRT, density, developer, dwell time, eddy currents, flaw, on page 1031, highlight gamma rays, hold points, IQI, main bang, NDE, NDT, penetrometer, piezoelectric, prod, ultrasonic, and x-rays. And that will be the last module out of our book, and we'll take a test for that here in a couple of weeks. Thank you for your attention.